So welcome everyone, this is Gihan Pereira and I want to talk about the future of conferences and how events are changing and how you can take advantage of these changes and leverage, leverage these changes to enhance your next event. Uh, I've worked with a number of um, conference organizers, event organizers, a number of different venues and clients around Australia and the region. And I want to share with you some of the things that I've found. And also, as a futurist, I have the opportunity to do research into what's happening uh, to the future of events. So people who don't know me, my name is GihanPereira.com. I'm a futurist, a conference speaker, an author, and a consultant. And um, many of you have already worked. I've, I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with you already. Uh, but if you haven't, um, then go to gihanspeaks.com and you can find out a little bit more about me. Uh, this webcast is not about me, it's about you and your conferences and your events. And so what I'm going to share with you comes from two broad sources. So one of them is some research that McCrindle Research did uh, last year about the future of business meetings. Specifically, they did this with the Melbourne Convention Bureau, so it's looking at Australia specifically. Now, I know there are people on this webcast who aren't in Australia, but most people on the webcast are. But also, this uh, this reflects what's happening in, happening in a lot of the Western world anyway. So part of it is that I'll be reporting on some of that research, but also I'll be sharing some of the experiences that I've had working with a, a wide variety of clients in a wide variety of venues and uh, in a number of different event and presentation formats. And that's one of the things that I think you should be doing with your speakers, tap into their expertise and their depth, because they might be running, uh, they, they might be presenting at events which are very different from, from yours. And you can tap into their knowledge and their skills and their experience there. So you should be talking to your speakers, your exhibitors, and your sponsors to try and get new ideas as well. And that's the reason I'm running this webcast, so I can, so I can share some of those ideas with you as well. I've also written a report, which um, many people here on this webcast will have already. It's called The Future of Conferences, and it's the 10 things that great conference organizers do differently. So many of the things that we're going to talk about today are there in more detail in that report. And if you haven't got the report already, you can download it. Um, you can download it now, in fact. So if you go to the handout section on the right-hand side of your um, go to webinar control panel, you will see a handout, which is not the handout of the slides, because you'll get that with the recording, but you'll get the uh, the Future of Conferences report, which you can download and read at your leisure. We're not going to cover all 10 things here, because I think that would be a waste of time to try and cover 10 big ideas in 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to pick and choose, but if you want the all 10 and you want them in more depth, then you can uh, have the report for reference. Um, it's available for you to download now. Many of you have already got it. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, how events have changed. And events used to be the place, uh, it used to be for many organizations, the only place where people could go to meet in person. So an organization would have a national conference, so it could be an association, could be a corporate, um, a corporate where they have multiple offices, but they bring their people together once a year or twice a year for their annual conference. And that's no longer the case. Of course, there are so many other options now for people to meet. So your job, in putting on an event is still to bring people together, to provide an environment for learning, for networking, for connections, but it's going to be more than just a single spark in the, the year or the, the, the life cycle of the organization or the annual cycle of the organization. So more and more, um, it's always been about lighting a fire beneath people, but it's more and more that now. And uh, there's some bad events and there's some great events. And uh, I've had the the good fortune and the honor of being a presenter, a keynote presenter at some great events. So let me talk about the, the, the six kinds of events that you get and the, the three bad ones are um, where the event gets canceled because there's no interest, the event gets put on but it's draining because people don't get any value from it, or it's or it's merely bland. And I know that the people that I've invited to this webcast don't run events that fall into any one of these three categories. I hope that you're creating events which fall into to one of these three categories. So the first level is where the event's engaging. So people turn up at the event, they it actually builds up their energy, it adds energy rather than detracting from it, and people feel engaged at the event. The next one is where the event's memorable. So not only do they feel um, 
feel that they had a great experience at the event, but also they remember it later. But what I'd really like you to do is create events that are remarkable. So remarkable is more than memorable. It's more than just, I remember what a great experience that was, but they remark on it afterwards. They take learnings away and they use that into in their day-to-day -day work. And I know from my experience uh, working with a number of organizations that uh, more and more people are asking uh, for remarkable events because they want it to be a big investment in an event. They want it to be more than just the two or three days of the conference or the half day um, at the, the compressed version of the event. They want it to be something that people remark on and actually changes uh, what happens to them in the future. So let's look at how you make your events more remarkable. So to get started with, I'd like to know who's in the room. So I know most of the people who are on this webcast, uh, but you don't. So I'm going to run a poll here and I'm going to ask very broadly, what is your main conference or event role? So I'm going to launch this poll here and uh, it's very broad. As you will see there, there's broadly three options that you'll see on the screen. So are you involved in the organization that's hosting the event? In, in other words, uh, are you a people leader in that organization? Um, are you a PCO or event organizer or meeting planner as they call them in some places? Uh, are you um, involved in a venue or some other kind of supplier or are you some other? So I'm going to, so as you know, you can, people have already started voting. That's great. Thank you very much for voting already there and for voting quickly. So about three quarters of the people have voted now. Um, and this is to, sh uh, to give you an idea of who's in the room, because um, I think most people, because this is an invitation only webcast, will fall into those top two categories. And uh, yeah, OK, great. That is the case. So let me close and share the results since almost everybody's voted now. OK, so as you can see, most people here are people from representing organizations who um, who host conferences, who run conferences. But uh, as you can see, there's also a large number of people here, um, almost uh, more than a third, in fact, who are um, either professional conference organizers or they're organizers within their, um, that they're responsible for organizing the conference. Uh, a conference within their organization. So thank you. I hope that gives you an idea of who's in the room. So let's have a look at, um, I want to share with you broadly three things. And I want to share with you to give you, to just give you a little bit of structure around this program. Um, the three things I want to share with you, uh, I want to share with you two trends, two people trends that are happening globally and locally. I want to share with you two threats to the traditional conference or events and how you can turn those threats into opportunities. And also broadly, um, I've called this tools, but it's a, it's kind of technology, it's kind of a presentation format, it's kind of um, event format and program format. So we're going to cover six things today and they're broadly going to fall under these three categories, trends, threats, and tools. And as a futurist, uh, I have a lot of people asking me, what's the future of my industry and how am I, what's, where's the disruption going to come from and how do I cope with disruption? And, and I always think that um, disruption is an interesting word because a lot of people fear disruption and uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I think disruption and innovation are exactly the same thing. It's just disruption when it happens to you and it's innovation when you do it. And as Jay Summit said in his book, Disrupt Yourself, um, every time there's a threat, uh, it's also an opportunity for somebody else. Uh, and I hope that I'll give you some insights here so that you can look at some of the things that are, if you like, disrupting the meetings and events industry, but you can also use them as opportunities and uh, you can leverage them yourself. OK, so let's start off by looking at these two trends. I want to show you two broad people trends. Uh, one is global and the other one is more local and is looking at the, the diversity in your event audience. So the global one is actually something that I share with my, in most of my keynote presentations. One of the big global megatrends is the shift in population. So for most of the last 50 years, our world economy has been dominated by these seven countries. So we've recently had a G7 summit with the USA and Canada. Um, in Europe, we've got the UK, France, Italy, Germany, and then we've got Japan. And PwC, 
predicts that by 2030, the power of the G7, the economic power, will be matched by these seven other countries, which they call the emerging economies. So we've got Mexico and Brazil, Turkey and Russia, China, India and Indonesia. And you can probably see that these are some of the countries, um, these are countries with some of the biggest populations on the planet. Therefore, they're going to have great economic power as well. And if you think that's 2030, um, if you look ahead another 20 years to 2050, the power of the G7 has faded and we have these seven frontier markets which will also share that economic power. So here in South America, we've got Peru and Colombia, Nigeria and Morocco, the Philippines, Bangladesh and Vietnam. So this is what our world is going to look like a generation from now. And again, if I look at it, this is an Australia-centric viewpoint. For us here in Australia, there's huge advantages uh, because we're right here on the doorstep of this Asian century and objectively if uh, if anybody was thinking about where you'd want to live if a, uh, an alien came from space and they looked at objectively what would they look for and um, they'd probably look for something with a democratic government with a reasonably strong economy a stable currency a whole bunch of other things that make us here in Australia um, one of the best places on the planet to be. So for the people on this webcast who are from Australia, great, we're in the best place in the world to be right now. Uh, if you're not, well, maybe you should consider moving here. Okay, so what does it mean? So that's the, that's a global view. So I really want to make the point and paint the picture that here in Australia, um, the meetings and events industry is growing and it's going to continue growing because uh, Australia is only going to become more and more important um, in the 21st century. Now, more locally than that, what does this mean for your conference audience? So the people who turn up to your conference broadly fall into three categories. So this is this is a generalization, but I'm looking at the Australian population and the typical people who turn up at a conference. Of course, um, every conference audience is different, so your mileage may vary. But broadly speaking, a quarter of the people are the baby boomers, and they're the sort of people who uh, they they are happy to, to look at somebody else to provide them the information at a conference. So uh, they happily sit in an audience and listen to a presenter on stage and they will, they're happy to go, okay, this is about you and I'm going to learn from you. The biggest group, which is my generation, is Gen X and it's about 40% of your conference audience. And they're the people who say, yes, we want to learn from you, but it's very much about us as well. So they want facilitation. They want the chance to work in groups. They want more breakout sessions. They want um, other formats, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but they want to work together in groups. And then of course, there's Gen Y, which is about a third and increasing. And they're of course the I generation. So they want to be involved as well, but they want to be involved at an individual level, which often means that they want to be involved using technology. And it's not surprising because that's how they engage um, with their peers and their, their colleagues, their friends. They expect to engage that way. So they're absolutely highly connected, but they want to engage in a way that, um, that they can have their individual say, not just be involved um, in a group setting or and not just sit silently and wait for um, information and resources to be fed to them. Um, let me put that another way. Uh, the three generations at your event are the baby boomers who like that kind of traditional lecture style of learning, and the Gen Xs who like the group interaction and discussion, and the millennials or the Gen Y who want individual interaction. Um, as I said, this is a generalization, but um, it's useful. All generalizations are useful, especially if they're somewhat accurate. And it really means that uh, your audiences are expecting different things from you from you when you're delivering your event. Um, let me just stop and just see if anyone's got any questions around that, because we've looked at these two things here. We've looked at the, the two people trends that we definitely got a more global um, audience and um, Australia is well placed for that. And also we've got that diversity of generations in the audience. So let me just quickly stop and see if there's any questions. Uh, so given that this is the first time I'm doing that, let me just remind you again, the way to ask a question is to type your question in the question panel and I'll respond as, uh, as we go. Um, if you don't have any questions yet, that's okay. Or if later in the webcast you have a question about something I covered earlier, that's okay as well. Please feel free to ask that um, at that time. So I will stop as we go and I'll answer questions as we go. 
Oh, okay, so question from Annie about uh, what about Generation Z? So Generation Z is the the younger generation. So they're the people who are pretty much just finishing school or just finishing uni. They're just about to enter the workforce. So absolutely, they're going to be a force to reckon with in the next five to 10 years. And in fact, the, a lot of people lump Gen Y and Gen Z together, but Gen Z is quite different demographically from Gen Y. So um, if we go back to that, let me go back to that slide there. So very soon we will have four generations at your event uh, because we'll still have a whole bunch of baby boomers, um, but we'll also have Generation Z in there as well. Yeah, thanks Annie. Okay, let me continue. So the second area is threats to the traditional conference or the traditional event. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the traditional event is going to be obsolete or it's going to become extinct. It simply means that people are doing more than the sort of things that they used to do to go to a conference for. They're sometimes getting in other ways as well. So the two things I want to talk about, um, looking at different formats, um, are online and virtual reality. So let me show you some of the McCrindle research around this. So McCrindle asked um, people in the meetings industry, which of these program formats will be very important to you in the future? And a lot of people, the majority of professionals, meeting professionals said, yep, we're going to expect some people who won't be physically at the event. So there'll be some kind of virtual attendance and that might be through things like live streaming. They're hybrid events. So hybrid events are a combination of um, online and in person. So there might be, for example, webinar, there might be something like this, like a webcast before the event. Um, and that might be not just a promotional webcast, but it might be part of the education, part of the, the event. And then the people turn up to the event. And after the event, they might have some other online learning that goes along with that. So quite often what I do is uh, after an event, I'll provide a follow up webcast, which might be, especially when I run a masterclass or a workshop, it might be simply a question and answer session a month afterwards so that people can then ask questions about the, the actions that they've taken in the 30 days or sometimes 60 or 90 days um, after the workshop or the masterclass. Mm -hmm. Not so many people said that they want to have unplugged conferences where it's a digital detox, where they go away and the conference is an opportunity for them to turn off technology and work on other stuff. So that was actually not seen as very high. So this, the two things, as I said, that they might be doing, in the, they will be doing in the future. One is in the near future, there'll be a lot more online engagement from delegates and attendees. And then in a little bit further on is virtual reality. Um, and I'm not suggesting that VR is something that's uh, imminent and an imminent threat to conferences, but I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what might be coming, coming up in the future so you can at least it'll inform your strategy even if it's not immediate actions. Let's look at these two things. So online is the first one. Um, I remember as an eight-year-old kid, uh, before we came to Australia, I remember reading a little book about Australia where I learned about the Royal Flying Doctor Service and the School of the Air. And uh, at the time I was eight and I was amazed that there were these other kids in Australia, in the outback, who had no access to a school anywhere near them, but they could still get an education because of the, the great work that the flying doctors were doing with the School of the Air. And um, so now, of course, we call it e-learning or virtual learning or online learning, but really we invented it here a hundred years ago. And now there's a whole bunch of providers who provide this online training or online courses and um, you may have done a massive open online course. Actually, let me ask this question because I often ask it with my conference audiences. Um, who has ever attended a MOOC? And the way I'd like you to answer this is you can see a little yellow hand button on your control panel. Can you please just uh, click that if you've attended a MOOC? Okay, I can see and I'm not going to call out names, but I will see how many people putting up their hands. Okay, so a couple, a few people have. Um, it's only attended, it doesn't mean you have to run one. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's, uh, so it's about, I'd say about 10% of the room here have attended a MOOC, so thank you for doing that. And that's actually, that's typical, it's, it's, it's in fact a little bit higher than most people. So for me, in when I ask this question in my audiences, typically, maybe 
three percent of the people in the room will put up their hands and i think you should do it uh, you should do it for two reasons so by the way if you're going to do it um, and i highly recommend it as a follow-up from this webcast uh, go to open to study.com so there's th these massive MOOCs with a hundred thousand students and they're quite intensive they might take four to eight w uh, hours a week of your work to do the online program, but you can also go to opentostudy.com, which is backed by a number of Australian and New Zealand universities, and they provide really high quality MOOCs um, in smaller groups and in sh um, the, the smaller programs. So they run for six weeks at a time, and they don't require as much of a commitment for you in terms of study outside the uh, watching the videos and engaging in the forums. Uh, so you have some lectures, you have some quizzes, you have some forums where you can engage with other students. And Open to Study is a great place for you to, if you've never done, if you've never experienced a MOOC, it's a really great way for you to experience it. Uh, partly for your own learning, but also partly to see how online learning is, uh, is dramatically affecting the way that people are getting education now. Because part of the reason that people used to go to conferences was, was it was one of the best places for them to get education. It's no longer that, tr that, that's no longer the case necessarily. People still go for that reason, but they can also get education in so many other ways. And this is one of the ways they're doing that. Okay, so that's the online side of it. The virtual reality side of it is it's quite interesting, but I don't think we're going to have to worry about this as people who are involved in the meeting industry for at least five years where it uh, becomes a real threat. But it is going to be something that's going to transform a lot of our lives, a bit like self-driving cars. When they come, they'll make a big difference to a whole bunch of industries. So virtual reality is the same. So this is me about four years ago at a real estate conference when realestate.com was first demonstrating their virtual reality headsets. And um, they're, they're great. They're great. You could walk around a home that you're thinking of buying um, and it could be on the other side of the world and you could walk around it doing an inspection just as you would if you went to a home open. So um, if you've never used a virtual reality headset, uh, you can get Google Cardboard free. You can download the, the pattern and uh, um, print it out in cardboard and make your own virtual reality headset that you stick your smartphone into. Or you can go to JB Hi-Fi and buy a virtual reality headset for 40 bucks, 50 bucks. So it is really becoming something that um, is easy and affordable. At the moment, it's being used a lot for games and demonstrations and a little bit in education, but it's certainly not mainstream yet, but it will be soon. And especially when we have this next step, which is where you can upload yourself into a virtual reality world. So I went to a futurist conference a couple of years ago as part of my own professional development. And there's this guy here in Melbourne, he has a studio um, in his, uh, you know, at, which he runs out of home. And he has these 87 cameras where they at different angles, he takes a photo of you and creates a virtual reality model of yourself, which you can then upload into a virtual reality world. And at the conference that I was at, he didn't have the whole setup because it was just in a trade booth, but he had enough cameras that he could do a virtual reality uh, scan of your face. So of course I had to do it. And uh, so he did a virtual reality scan of my face. And three days later after the conference en uh, ended, he sent me um, the virtual reality file which uh, allowed me to move my face around in virtual reality. Um, and you can imagine in the future that people will be attending events in VR. So you could be at an event and you could look around. It's like you're in an audience. You can see the speaker, but everyone is in a virtual uh, virtual environment. So if you know if this, that sounds a bit weird and scary and uh, perhaps a bit disconnected at the moment, um, and you've never tried virtual reality before, I think you should because you might be surprised to find just how realistic it is. Um, one other example, there's an app that you can get on your phone called Virtual Speech. It's not quite what I described. It's actually for presenters, for public, uh, for people who have to make presentations, and not for professional speakers, but for people who don't have to make presentations often. So they might be a little bit uh, nervous and uncomfortable in front of an audience. And, and, and you know, many of your internal speakers are, uh, are in that situation. So this is something I recommend you do. If you've got internal speakers, um, refer them to this app. So they go to virtualspeech.com, they download the app, um, and they get a VR headset, either from JB Hi-Fi or Google Cardboard. They put it on and they can practice their presentation as if they were in front of a conference audience. In fact, there are two versions of this. There's the conference audience and there's a boardroom audience. So they put on the virtual reality headset, they can choose whether they're in a, um, in a large auditorium 
or in a small boardroom, they can upload their PowerPoint slides and they can present and they can look they can look behind them and they see their slides playing on the screen um, with the audience. They can choose whether the audience is engaged or bored. Uh, and that's quite interesting. So they can set up their boardroom audience where the, the other virtual reality characters are um, just they, they check in their email or they walk in and out and it gives them uh, somewhat of an experience of what it's like presenting. So if you've got presenters um, at your event who are um, who are a little bit nervous or uncomfortable and they're generally they're the internal speakers, it's not their day job to be a presenter, um, refer them to this app because it's really useful for them to just present and rehearse in a way that might be, uh, it'll just give them a little bit of help before they present in front of their, their live audience. The other thing with virtual reality, of course, is that when you get this kind of realistic environment, people just aren't going to put up with things like bad PowerPoint anymore. So um, in fact, I was as part of the research for this webcast, I was looking around for examples of poor PowerPoint and I came across this slide for a couple of years ago. I won't say where I got it from, uh, no names, no pack drill, but I came across this slide um, which is presenting that same information, coincidentally, that I presented to you earlier um, in this webcast. Now here's the E7 and the G7, um, but instead of showing it like a nice map like I did, um, the presenter had done it simply as bullet points and unfortunately there are too many presentations which are, um, which are just like this, so it's so a boring bullet points and uh, yeah, so the problem is, of course, that most of the presenters at your event aren't, um, they're, they're not professional presenters. It's not their day job to be making presentations and to spend, to invest time in creating great PowerPoint. So you get slides like that, or you get slides like this, which um, put your audience to sleep and uh, people fill the time and they, they believe they're delivering information, which they are, but the information is not being received and not being retained by the audience. And there's really, um, now with some of the tools that are available that are built into PowerPoint, you don't need to do this. You can, there are now tools like, um, you know, PowerPoint Smart Art, which means that you never have to show bullet, bullet points ever again, but most presenters don't know how to use that. Um, and they should, they should. So, um, help your presenters create better slide presentations because audience is expecting more, especially the Gen Ys and Gen Zs who are so used to having such high quality visuals in their presentations. Okay, so let me just stop for questions. Um, we've done two out of the three and the timing's going perfectly. So any questions about um, online events, which are hybrid events, and also about virtual reality. As I said, virtual reality is a, a bit further in the future, but um, I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that. Okay, Jim says, what is that PowerPoint thing you said? Oh, it's a smart art. Um, actually, I might, let's see how our time, our time's going well, actually. Let me demonstrate smart art to you. So when I run, um, when I run programs about how to deliver better PowerPoint, uh, one of the things I show people is the use of smart art. Um, can I just, actually, let me, let me see. Can I have a quick show of hands? Um, how many people know and use smart art already in their PowerPoint presentations? Can you just raise your hand? Because if everyone's doing it already, I won't bother. But okay, so I think you've got, only a couple. Okay, okay, good. Let, let me demonstrate that to you. Yeah, I think we've got time to do that. And uh, okay, so this isn't part of the slideshow, but let me jump out of the slideshow. So we're kind of doing this without a net here, but we'll see how we go. Okay, let me do a smart art demonstration for you. All right, so here's a slide. Here's a bad slide, which has got um, bullet points on it. Um, and we want to create so, so my rule is never, never, never show a bullet point on any slide. And uh, that, if you use that as a starting point and you, you have the rule that you're never allowed to use bullet points on slides, then you have to find other ways to do it. So let me show you one of the most useful ways that's built into PowerPoint and most people don't know how to use it. So let's take this slide here. I'm not going to try and type all the words, but let's see what we've got, technology, um, supply chain, cost reduction, efficiency. Okay, so let's do this. So what is it called? Factors. So let's call this BPO factors. Okay, 
Okay, I'll just do three of these for you. A cost reduction efficiency as a delivery okay. of talent, say best talent. Recruit, retain, you say reward. And what's the other one? Business price operation, okay, risk. Um, contingency. Okay, so if somebody creates a bullet, uh, a slide like this with a bullet list, there's a feature in PowerPoint called Smart Art which converts that into a visual. So under here, uh, convert to Smart Art graphic, I can go here and immediately, uh, instantly convert what was originally a boring bullet list into something much more appealing. So now, instead of showing a bullet list on my screen, I've now got this diagram. Um, I can do a little bit better than that. It allows me to change the color scheme and the color scheme will match whatever theme I'm using, whatever template I'm using in PowerPoint. I can make the uh, individual blocks look a little bit more attractive and I can even animate it. So let me animate it so they appear one by one. Okay, so that probably took me, I don't know, what, a minute, 30 seconds after I've done all the typing. Let me show you how that looks now when I present that in my show. So that this is kind of like a pretend show here. So I'm talking about factors which affect BPO. And let me talk about supply chain first. And technology is the biggest factor there. And then how do you get your best talents? It's not only about recruiting the best talent, blah, blah, blah. It's also about how to retain the best talent and then how to reward and then risk and contingency, blah. Okay, so you can see with Smart Art, um, it's very easy to turn what was a very unattractive slide with just a bullet list into something which is much more attractive and much more visually appealing. And because I've done it with animation, as I'm talking, I can go click, 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 and it moves on to the next the next item. And um, so if you haven't used Smart Art before or you haven't showed your um, your presenters, especially your internal presenters, how to use Smart Art, I really think it's worth doing. And uh, if you're watching the recording of this, then you can uh, go through that little demo over and over again to see how easy it is to use. But really, it, is, it isn't hard at all. Okay, was it useful? I hope so. Okay, with that little diversion out of the way, let's move on to the third area. Oh, any other questions? Let me just quickly check. Ah, Nikki says, very useful, thank you. Um, in fact, like that whole thing, it just made me think that the whole idea of presenting better visuals is something that, uh, as a as a professional speaker, this is my day job, so I obsess about it and make sure that the visuals are, are beautiful, but um, most people don't. But there are some simple things they can do, like smart art, like using uh, full page graphics that they will be really useful for people to know. So can I quickly just check, um, because this is not the only time I'm going to run this webcast, I'm happy to run future webcasts. Um, are you interested in me running a webcast about about this, better visuals with things like smart art and uh, the simple things that you can share with your speakers, especially your internal speakers. If you are, then can you just raise your hand so I get some idea of the interest? Okay, lots of hands going up, great. Thank you, Simone, Tracy, Sandra, great. Okay, most people are saying yes. Okay, so we'll do that, we'll do that. And um, thank you for that. Let me lower hands, brilliant. Okay, so we'll do that sometime in the future, um, maybe around about September time. Okay, so let's look at the third one, and these are these are tools. So this is uh, broadly about technology, but it's not only about technology. Um, now I shared this in the original email that I sent out, um, promoting this or uh, announcing this webcast. The five things that people in the meeting industry said were really valuable. Oh, sorry, were were the things that are going to have the biggest impact for them in the near future around technology are this. So real-time language translation, because you're going to have a more global audience and a more diverse audience and group of delegates. And the idea of the Internet of Things, so having um, internet-enabled devices everywhere, so not just in your smartwatches and your Fitbits, but imagine if you had all your seats were internet-enabled and they could uh, they could measure how restless the audience is or how engaged the audience is at any time. So that's not that's not so much science fiction at the moment. Um, AR and VR, so virtual reality I've already mentioned, augmented reality where people are walking around and their, their glasses or their contact lenses will give them information. Maybe it'll tell you something about the, the other 
the delegate that you're going to talk to at the coffee stand. Maybe it'll tell you about what's coming up in the in the room. So what workshop sessions are coming up in the room that you're standing outside of the door. This idea of live information feeds is really interesting. A lot of speakers are worried by this and they feel threatened by it because the, the idea here is that as I'm presenting, I will get information about what the audience likes and in what direction they want me to take my presentation. Actually, I, I guess we had a simple example of that recently here, like five minutes ago with the smart art demo. As a result of the question, I could I did a little I broke away from my standard script, if you like, or the slideshow to demonstrate something else. So that's the idea that the presentation gets adapted based on the what the audience wants. So it's like a choose your own adventure and you need presenters who are flexible enough to to adapt to that and to to serve the audience needs, which is the way it should always be anyway. And finally, there's an interesting idea there idea there about interactive tables where the, the tables that people are working at um, are not just solid wood, but they're interactive as well. And the, the ways that people can engage either with each other or with the presenter through their tables. So I just want to give that to you as a little bit of interest. And if you download the Future of Conferences report, you read a little bit more about that. But I want to specifically look at two other things around the tools and the technology that you're using. So one is around interaction. And the other one is how do you extend the, con the the event experience using technology? So the interaction thing, this probably comes as a surprise to nobody, that the McCrindle research said that in the future, uh, more and more of the delegates want to be more active participants. And that this is especially true when you've got the Gen Ys and Gen Zs coming through into workforces, and therefore into events. So people want to do more than just attending. They want to be participants as well. So traditionally, these are sort of things that people do. Uh, so these are sort of sessions that conferences and events have run. Typical keynote, workshop or breakout, a fireside chat or a panel discussion. And I've been involved in all of these, so moderating panels. And so mostly what I do is keynotes, but quite often people want an extended keynote or a workshop. But then there are a whole bunch of other options as well that, um, you know, more and more conferences and events are doing now and I've seen some of these uh, and I've done some of these myself. So for example, there's um, so open space is one that I'm running at a, a workshop that I'm facilitating tomorrow where um, around the room we're going to set up uh, four flip charts at corners of the room and we'll have four presenters there presenting to a small group and the audience can choose which group they go around to. And this is, this is a small event, so there's probably 50 or 60 people. So each of the four presenters is only going to have 10 to 15 people there. No microphone, just a flip chart. They're going to present an idea and the audience can choose which one they go to. And the idea of open space is that they've got the, the law of the two feet, which is that they can walk around and they can leave at any time and go to see something else. So I, I see more and more events doing innovative things like this. And uh, because people are expecting, people are demanding that they have uh, the opportunity to participate in different ways, not just to, um, not just to sit and have the traditional kind of presentation with you know, like a keynote or a workshop. Um, I see an absolutely from Nikki, which is I think that the idea about, uh, I hope that I think that's the idea around participation. And Alex also says, yep, it's really interesting. So if you haven't tried some of these before, again, these are not too hard to research how they work and how to make them work. Um, again, we could run a session on this uh, sometime later um, and we might consider that. Uh, but these are sort of things that, that smart conference organizers and organizations are doing to make the events more engaging and interactive. And let me show you another one. So how do, how do people interact in session at your event? So I'm actually going to do one with this group here so on this webcast. So, you know, there are a number of things that people do to engage. So I've, I've got a, f a small list here and I'm going to ask you to share yours, but don't do it on um, just in the question box, I'm going to ask you to use this this other tool. So, you know, the sort of things like obvious ones are like show of hands, talk to people at the table, you get people to write on flip charts, you might have flip chart at each table. There are online tools like Slido, so you can do online Q&A, and um, online polls and so on. We've already done an online poll here, but there are tools that you can do either through your event app or through some, some third party software where you can do polls. Um, so let me ask you, what are the things that you're doing at um, in your events to get your delegates uh, to get your delegates to 
uh, interact. And I'm going to ask you to use this tool. So go to askgihan.com. It's not a tool I developed, but it's a tool that, I've, that I'm using. So go to your web browser at askgihan.com. And let me bring that up myself. And you should get this screen here. How do you delegates interact in session? If you click the little pink button down the bottom and you go, okay, so my name's Gihan and delegates interact in my session using Padlet. Padlet, by the way, is this tool that we're using right now. So just go there, click, type your name and a tool that people use to interact. And uh, we'll see, we'll see what the group comes up with. You know, there's a saying that the smartest people in the room, the smartest person in the room is the room itself. And this is part of what people are expecting, that they're expecting to have um, more ways for them to engage. And especially Gen Ys, they want to interact this way. So they want to have their say individually, but also to have their, their views seen. Yeah, so poll everywhere, which is the one that Jacobs mentioned. That's uh, online polling, which is the one I use as well. If the event organizer doesn't have it, um, easy to use. Very, um, it's just a monthly subscription. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll leave that running because you might want to share some others, and you can always go back to that window and see what other people have shared. So just the last thing I wanted to share is the idea of lifelong learning. So again, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that uh, delegates are expecting events to give them ongoing learning, not just at the event itself. Um, and it's so important. Uh, people who've worked with me, you know that when a part of what I offer is not just delivering a great presentation, which is important, of course, but what else can you do? What else can I do before your event, during the event, and after the event to help you turn the event into more than just the one or two days that, are, that, are, that you're there, and especially more than just the 45 to 60 minutes where you've got me speaking for a keynote presentation. So there are things like self-assessment tools and um, helping with CPD accreditation, that's before the event, afterwards, reference material, sending the Future of Leadership course to delegates, um, running follow-up web webinars and webcasts and so on, and more and more um, events and delegates are expecting this now from their presenters and of course from the event itself. So um, think about how you can make your event um, longer than just the time that from the from the opening session to the closing keynote. Uh, what can you do to to make it life uh, to make an exp uh, opportunity for lifelong learning? Okay, let me just stop to see if there's questions. Uh, comments somebody said I can't get in but I think they have now so I think that's all right okay so we talked about these two things in terms of tools we talked about interaction and engagement tools and we talked about extending the life of your event so I want to finish on time and we're pretty much on time right now so we looked at these two trends these two threats if you like but I'd like to think of them as opportunities for creating better experiences and more compelling experiences. And we looked at some of the tools. Now, of course, we only looked at these fairly broadly, but I'm more than happy to cover some of these in future webcasts. It looks like the room has spoken and they said they'd like to have the uh, things about uh, visuals. So we'll do that next time around. Um, if you found this useful, please let me know because uh, I, will, I do want to continue to help you with this. So let me finish with a story uh, or a question. So. Is this a heap of sand? Let's say that's sand there. I think you'd say yes. That looks like a heap of sand, Gihan. Yep, that's an obvious question. It looks like a heap of sand. So if I said to you, if I take away a grain of sand, is it still a heap of sand? And you'd say yes, it is. If I took away another one, and another one, another one, I could take away probably a thousand grains of sand, and it would still be a heap of sand, and maybe a few thousand. Eventually, when it gets down to a few little grains of sand sitting on the table, on the slide, would you say that's a heap of sand? The answer is no, of course not. But my question is this, when did it stop being a heap of sand? See, there's no real way to tell exactly when that happens. And this is exactly what happens with many industries. It's very rare that an industry just gets disrupted. It happens occasionally, but usually the signs are there already and you might lose a grain of sand. You might get a delegate who decides not to come this year because they can't afford it or they don't want to do the travel or they get their education elsewhere. You might get a sponsor who decides that they're gonna 
downgrade their level of sponsorship this year, you might find that the speakers you want aren't available. And it's like these little grains of sand that are slowly eroding away what you've got. And um, eventually you'll wake up one day and you find that they actually haven't got a heap of sand anymore and you've lost what you've got. So don't let that happen to you. Um, many businesses are finding that at the moment they, they're waiting for this big thing that's going to disrupt them and they forget that the wind's coming along and blowing away their grains of sand one at a time and eventually they'll end up with nothing. So don't let that happen to you. I hope you've got some value today from this webcast that will help you and make sure that it doesn't happen to you. Um, as I said, uh, please download the, the special report if you don't already have it. Many of you already do, but if you don't, you can download that in the, the handout section on the right-hand side. Um, and please give me any feedback as well. So if you've got any feedback, you can email me, kihana, kihanparera.com. If you want to book me to speak at your conference, of course, please get in touch. Uh, happy to talk to you about that or to run workshops, masterclasses, or mentoring, even if you have booked me in the past, there are some other things that we can perhaps do to work together. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the webcast. I hope you got value from it. I, I really do believe passionately in the meetings and events industry. And uh, as a futurist, I want to help you be fit for the future. So thank you for coming along. Please send me your feedback and uh, I'll send you an invitation to the next one as well. If you are attending this live, then I'll also send you a copy of the, of the recording. If you're watching the recording of this, then and you haven't got the report, then drop me an email and I'd be more than happy to send you that report as well. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.